one. I'm Ann Marshall and welcome to Art, Archetype and Ancient Wisdom. Today I'm with local St. Augustine, Florida artist Nancy Hamlin Vogler and she's a mixed media artist and also um, a, a, a regular exhibitor in this area as well as in other parts of the country. She's been granted awards and recipients of various grants as well. And as I think of your work, I know that you participate in drawing and painting and the mixed media that I mentioned, as well as screen printing and intuition and real, realism. But I wanna mention right off the bat that I'm working off of some cards because we have a lot of information that we wanna cover and Nancy may have some notes too. So in order to not leave anything important out, you may see us referring to our notes. But importantly, Nancy, I wanna ask you, is there something else that you'd like to add about your introduction? Well, thank you, Anne, and you did a great job in describing my mediums and exactly she really uh, honed on, on my style of, of work. And yes, actually the painting you see here is going to be in the Endless Summer exhibit at Arts on Douglas in New Smyrna uh, during the month of August. And I also have a painting going out to the Woodson Art Museum in uh, Wausau, Wisconsin for their Birds in Art 2023, uh, the 48th annual. I'm absolutely floored and very thrilled to have a piece accepted in that show. That's a big show. In fact, I, I had um, neighbors that I think really were instrumental in getting that whole concept off the ground decades ago so it's it's amazing that I even recognize it and know how what a big honor that is Wonderful. yeah yeah, yeah. so we are here today in your studio and this is just an incredible experience to me it's like magic land and <laughs> can, tell us about where we are in your in your studio here and the magic that happens <laughs> Well, uh, this studio, yes, is in St. Augustine, Florida, and it's my backyard studio. It's in the backyard of um, my old 19th century house, and we're about two blocks from the Fountain of Youth Archaeological State Park in St. Augustine. It's a beautiful area, lots of live oaks, birds, uh, flora in abundance, and all this stuff is really has been uh, a constant inspiration for me to be able to come from my kitchen to my backyard studio in about 50 steps. <laughs> so, so welcome. I hope um, it's, it's a large space. I'm really grateful to have this space, uh, especially since I used to be, uh, do silk screen printing, which uh, by its very nature of uh, uh, using organic, well, not organic vapors, which are not organic at all, they're toxic. So I had to open the whole place up when, while I was printing it worked out very well. Um, now I'm doing more painting with aqueous materials and they are not toxic. So so it's it's a pleasurable place to work. So I think next to you then is this display of kind of where maybe you actually started out at as the fine art card maker and still carry on that, that business of the card but then certainly evolved to something um, of the different mediums and uh, then different actual results in terms of size and presentation and all. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that path? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. So after college, where I was a French major, I, I taught French for a few years and then went to grad school in, uh, in Maine to also study French literature. And during that time, oddly enough, I uh, I took art, I gravitated to the art department. I had always been like a hobby artist, uh, Summers, but um, I just was so taken by the uh, printmaking department and learned the, silk, the process of silkscreen printing. And at, so armed with that knowledge, I um, abandoned my idea to become to go on it for a PhD and become a French professor. And uh, instead, I started a greeting card company. Back then, it was known as Northern Kingdom Printworks. And then when I moved, um, returned from a trip 
to Colorado, I named the company Eastern Sun Printworks. And at this point, well, that was maybe almost 40 years ago. Um, and at you know, the time of about 35 years ago, I decided that silkscreen printing was a little bit too repetitive and I had other things I wanted to explore in the art field, namely fine art, painting, do more drawing and painting. So the cards are now uh, printed uh, via digital files and they are absolutely beautiful and you still will see them in some stores. Uh, and here in St. Augustine, you will definitely see them at Butterfield Garage. So I'd really love for you to share with us if it only takes 50 steps to go between home and creativity, how do you describe your practice? Like, do you show up in this luxury space seven mornings or seven days a week for X number of hours or only on a whim? Or how do you, how do you structure that? That's a great question. I, I was almost going to interject, yes, I show up in my pajamas, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's, it's great because uh, I, I come out here sometimes and just sit and I, I look around. I have lots of uh, materials out here that I also use for my installations, um, for the drawings and paintings that we'll talk about later. Um, but it, um, beyond the convenience factor, and, and believe me, not every day am I inspired. Uh, sometimes I told someone in a talk a couple of weeks ago that it was not sheer joy to come out here to paint. It was sometimes sheer terror. So there are, you know, the usual emotions that we have in our lives that go into um, being an, an artist that I feel I can carry, albeit the convenience and total um, uh, luxury of having my own space um, every day. Well, I think you really touched on a very important part that some of the viewers would be interested in because many of them are artists and looking at the artist archetype, um, you know, part of that is the fear, the, the shadow aspect of, of exposing yourself to the vulnerability and, and what that means then to really express yourself in ways that people might not understand or appreciate. But my point being that experiencing that, how do you get past that? Right. Uh... Often, yeah, you, you have to jump, take a leap of faith almost. And I'm looking at my two most recent pieces, which are really crazy abstracts. They're totally different from what I've done, and I haven't really shown them. But, but you know, the, the, I've suddenly lost my train of thought here. But the, the part that uh, is important, I think, is that one, one just keep on, keep on making marks, keep on making brush strokes. And uh, now my Buddhist teacher, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, has a uh, very good quote, which I will read here so I don't mess it up. But he says, doubt is fertile ground for possibilities. And I add, and I'm just, I think he would agree with me, and for magic. So really, when you're in this netherland, of either joy, terror, doubt, fear, hope, success, failure, you know, all of these emotions that we all have at some point or another, you have to kind of accept that and then move on. So the moving on part is sometimes difficult. You know, I, I do not really come out here every single day. Sometimes, you know, it gets to be three o'clock and, well, you know, I just can't muster, getting the paints out and doing it. Other times I will come out here at three o'clock and just work like wildfire, turn the music up and, um, you know, my husband will go, uh, hey, you want some dinner? <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it's part of the, of the gratitude that I have for being able to live essentially. And are there any rituals that support you in the art making practice? Like, 
being able to show up or being able to show up inspired? Yeah. Well, yes, there are two types of rituals. One is I will go into a practical art one, which is called uh, process. And I've learned this from, uh, I've studied independently with Louise Freshman Brown, who is a Jacksonville artist and former professor at UNF. And I've taken a lot of her workshops and she always starts us with the processes, which can be anything from drawing with your non-dominant hand uh, starting from the bottom of the page instead of the top, uh, just all these kind of crazy, um, maybe almost not really formulaic, but um, just re repetitive, um, repetitive things. So I usually incorporate those processes into after I set up an installation or an, something that I'm going to be observing and translating onto the substrate of paper or wood panel, my favorite things. Um, I, I will just do some quick drawings and maybe even a lot of them. I have a lot of paper, I have a lot of old paper. It's always good paper, but it may have marks on it, so I just sew over it and work again. So the process, that, that's part of my drawing process, art making process. Another process, you could say, is uh, my dedication to uh, meditation. Uh, sitting meditation in the style of Tibetan Buddhism. So that is something that um, really uh, maintains, I don't know if maintain is the right word, but it definitely is part of my day. And that's usually in, not early in the morning, but in the morning. So between meditation, but you know, people ask me sometimes, oh, the Buddhist, so when you come out and paint, do you kind of pray or do you have some ritual you do before you paint? And it doesn't quite work like that, at least not for me. So I'd like to hope that the practice, the meditation practice that I've been doing for many years, actually, uh, I'm definitely not a Buddha, but <laughs> you know, to having that, that basis in sitting mm -hmm. and just kind of letting go and then finding something will pop into my mind again, let it go. And repeating that um, over time can, I hope, become incorporated in my, in my life and in my uh, relationship with other people as well as in my relationship with my art. So I'm hearing two things. <clears throat> One is that your initial drawing with a non-dominant hand or starting from the bottom of the page up it reminds me like playing the scales before you move into Debussy or something. Right. And yeah. then the other thing is about the meditation is that kind of bringing your awareness to the presence so that you can be open as an intuitive channel. Uh, very well said. Yes, it, it, it is exactly that kind of clearing, although understanding that, you know, the fog will come in again, or the confusion, or the disappointment, but then there's, you, you, you become confident, I think, of, of that intuitive um, channel that will allow, uh, you know, in a very ephemeral way, for everything to mm. fall in. It, it's, and you know, I think when I'm, when I'm working, um, in, in layers, like people ask me, how, what do you do first? Well, beside the process part, um, and again, thanks to my, thank, thanks to Louise, um, I have been trained and accustomed to going back over something and maybe either just sewing it out and turning to it or even or just just slamming on more color more collage more marks and um, and seeing where where that will will end and then you know if it doesn't end well I still have that piece of paper and I can do another drawing on it. So that brings me to, to ask do you throw anything out? <laughs> No, <laughs> I don't. I have little scraps of paper everywhere. Um, and, and that's probably a little 
silly, but um, but as far as no, and I recommend you all to just buy, go for the expensive paper, beautiful rag paper by Reeves or um, Stonehenge or uh, Arches, any of those, and um, uh, just keep keep working on it. And, um, and you know, you can also tear up your drawings and paintings and make collages. So have you ever experienced a tension between wanting to make art, I'll call it commercially, that you have hopes of selling versus something that you have maybe brewing inside as an expression? Like, I know some people watching this, you know, maybe fighting between feeling that they need to make an, an earning or uh, can they forego that and make what they want. I mean, have you ever dealt with that? And how have you resolved it? Well, again, um, I ha my husband had had a, had an, a livelihood. He was a nurse. And um, so it, it wasn't like I felt forced to um, make a living as an artist but then again back then I, I, I ran a greeting card company so I definitely thought about uh, economic matters uh, I actually find accounting sort of interesting and I did it all you know back then I ran a I ran a, a little shop with employees and we had sales reps we had distribution we sent cards all over the country and so that was that was a commercial enterprise, and it was profitable. And um, uh, I, I can't really say the same thing about fine art. Uh, although I have done many art shows, the outdoor festivals we have lots of them in Florida and around the country. And sometimes those have been very profitable. Other times, not so much. Um, currently, I'm in a gallery. It's a collective uh, local gallery named Butterfield Garage and uh, th that's certainly an opportunity to sell my work is on the wall all the time and people you know know about me however I can't say that you know it just flies away all the time you know art is such a um, um, ephemeral well that word um, it's 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 difficult because people don't have room on their walls or they don't have you know any discretionary funds after all it's kind of it's a luxury but I'm you know nonetheless I'm extremely happy for the people who do collect my art and I know they love it and you know um, The material, you know, the mercantile aspect of it will always be there. Um, I think, and, and it's it's also the. I feel badly just making art and having it pile up. So I like to. Um, an another idea I have for people is to really make an effort to, you know, to present your work to galleries, to find a show that might be appropriate where you could apply and submission fees aren't that high, um, just make yourself available and you'd be surprised. People will want to support you and a lot of people do. Mm, that's very, very good advice. <clears throat> so how do you balance the art making business and the art making practice? It, it used to be that when when I ran the greeting card company, I, I would not have time to make art. You know, if a workshop was every six months, I would not make art in between workshops. I would make cards. Uh, nowadays, I I really I, I have a rep out in the Bay Area, and she um, sends me orders occasionally, and I have a few um, house accounts who who write to me and make orders actually. Powell's Books in Portland is a really good customer. They buy the cards. And I just feel 
wow, this is this is great. And I have an Etsy shop too where I sell prayer flags, um, Tibetan Himalayan style prayer flags. And I feel that's a very um, lovely um, option and people love them. I make them in rainbow colors and that's really a nice thing to imagine people hanging on outside of people's homes. So, you know, the balance part, I don't know quite how to respond, except I can, you know, I can bear with it and feel happy. Mm -hmm. Those prayer flags, are they um, screen printed on fabric or how, how do you? Yes, oh, yeah, okay. they're screen printed. Now, over in the Himalayas, <coughs> I've been to Nepal, I've not been to Tibet, but um, they are traditionally woodblock printed, carved in wood blocks, wow. and then um, uh, printed by the monks um, on very thin muslin. So I have taken um, a pattern uh, that's a free range, I don't know, or not copyrighted. It's a general prayer for happiness for all beings that's in Sanskrit and made screens. And then I've made some mantra, um, designs, like mandala designs that are printed on flags too. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, it's fun, it's fun to do. And, yeah. Now, you know that I'm very much interested in the influence of archetypes. And so I was wondering if any of these might resonate with you. And so I, I made a short list. If you'll just listen to the list and see if anyone really hits you, Maybe it won't, or maybe something else comes to mind. So the list I made was adventurer, detective, hermit, shaman, shapeshifter, mystic, alchemist, dreamer, seeker, and storyteller. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, I... I Definitely, um, probably storyteller, shapeshifter may fall to the less thought of, but I, I feel in a way parts of many of those qualities. Um, in, well, adventurer in that I did go on an adventure a long time ago overseas and I was some um, around the world with a backpack for two and a half years and that was just really amazing and, and at, in my 30s so all those years ago uh, it still I feel it still resonates with me and it's so important to kind of get out of our comfort zone and go somewhere else so that that part and alchemy right transmuting mm -hmm. metal into gold mm -hmm. I I love to think that the art making process has this uh, aspect of, of alchemy and, and, and magic. Um, maybe shaman seeker would not come in. Um, yeah, hermit. I <laughs> I could be a hermit. I was a hermit for a while. Um, and but it, but definitely adventure, adventure. Um, and it, I had written down in my notes the. the uh, quote about doubt being the ground for discovery. So, I mean, adventure and doubt or being in the unknown, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. is, um, yeah, very but much. I'd love to learn more about, about these um, categories. Well, and being in that unknown, being out of the comfort zone, I think is very much in keeping with the artistic process, because every time you're facing that blank slate, it, you know, you do have to kind of get past that moment of entering into the unknown. So I can see where that's in keeping. And, and I definitely think that the whole idea of alchemy is very much in alignment with uh, artistry because it, it's like, it, this is the laboratory, you know, this is right. where it happens. And, and alchemy always applies pressure. And so maybe it's the friction of pen on paper or you know the viscousness of water and paint. 
but you know you're adding the ingredients and you don't know how it's going to turn out mm -hmm. but it's going to be something beyond the sum of its parts mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i can really relate with that what are you working on now well i just finished the shoreline series called hanging by a thread which uh, was on display at um in a uh, featured artist at butterfield garage um, I'm trying to get a few of those pieces still finished, even though the show is over, I'm still working on those pieces. And um, so I, I am, I'm, these, these abstract pieces that I'm doing are, are very intriguing. So I think I'm gonna do a few more of those and then get back to the Backyard Studio Kitchen, which is coming up next year in sort of a, a revisited um, form at Arts on Douglas smart of the beach. I have a whole gallery myself for a month and that's going to be very exciting. So the art, the backyard studio kitchen was the still life with kitchen elements, a tea kettle, um, uh, kitchen utensils, um, you know, a bunch of still life stuff from, from the kitchen that I kept drawing for about a year and painting and had a show of that called Swimming in the And I'm always intrigued by going back to figurative work. Wow. Um, I have a, basically these categories that I feel like I revisit. You know, shoreline, Buddha land, um, strange birds. I didn't even really talk about strange birds. Um, the, the, jet, the still life. And um, I think that's five. Anyway, uh, that maybe will be my top my topics. Oh, and, and figurative. So the figurative one has really taken a back seat these last few years. Mm. Would have been interesting. You can pose for me. Oh, okay. okay. And, um, I'd, I'd love to. Because I love to incorporate <clears throat> figures in a still life. It really lightens. Mm. Wow. You know, gives it this human um, aspect mm. too, so we can. Okay. Um, I I love kind of hearing how your your work is just evolving but also coming back around so many many layers and um, just just a, a process that is continuous and for people watching you can check out the website is listed below uh, in the description here and social media links are posted as well so that people can connect with you um, and is there something else you want to talk about briefly before we bring things to a close? I want to make sure we capture what's important to you. Well, you, um, we had spoken some time about a, a, a world view of um, what, what art, contemporary art especially, or any art, really does contain the possibilities for changing the world. And I think, you know, while that's maybe very grandiose for me to think of calling my work anything like that, but what I like to say is that the person who views my work has the potential to change their world in, in the sense that by allowing them to pour through my layers of um, lines and marks and smooshes and collages and silkscreen marks, you may discover, discover something that I had no intention of, of, uh, of putting out there, but you have created that. So, so to um, allow the viewer to interact that way is, is um, a strong desire uh, of mine. While I know it's rather unsaid in the pieces, you know, so does that respond to the question? And if it does, maybe you can put very succinctly, what is it that you want the world to know? Right, it, it was riffing off of that. Um, and and I, I could, I mean, my first thought was, you know, John Lennon, you know, we want, we want imagine peace. <laughs> we want the world to, uh, 
I want the world to know that I, I wish that for everyone, peace and happiness and um, compassion, love, equanimity, all those good things. And I'm really not sure I am painting that, but I keep trying, you know? And each time I go out, one thing that does kind of uh, urge me to get back to work is to do another, do a better painting, you know, do another one, do, I mean, not really better in a qualitative way, but anyway, do a good one. So what I hear you saying then in response to that question that I always like to end with is that you know in your heart that art can change the world. Right. And you question whether or not your art can change the world, but your hope is that your art can change the viewer, right. one person who's viewing your work. Right. Wow. Right. Yeah, it's, it's sort of hard for me to think of the world even having traveled it, you know, but before I, I did that trip, I was, you know, lived in the Northeast and didn't travel anywhere. But, um, but you know, it, everyone may, can make a difference. Each individual can make a difference. That was well put. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank Every, you so Everyone much. can make a difference. Just a complete pleasure and delight to be with you here today. I mean, I almost feel like crying because I think it's, it's just so impactful and, and yet the simplicity is underlying it all. And I'm just so grateful. Thank you very, very much. Please check out, woo, yeah, let's Thank you, celebrate her. Please, please check out Nancy's website, contact her for more information. Thank you very, very Thank much you. for for even considering me. Here I go. We're just throwing <laughs> papers everywhere. I think it's appropriate in the studio, That's right? That's right. It is. We and we're not going to throw them out. We can use these as collage. <laughs> all right. Every well, little bit. Thank you all for watching. Thank you.